Ephesians 5, from verse 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Good evening, church. Uh, good to see you all. My name is Z. I'm one of the pastoral interns here at uh, Grace Bible Church. Um, we're talking about marriage tonight, and I'm feeling somewhat inadequate for several reasons. Uh, firstly, my wife, Rachel, and I, we've been married for just under five years now. Um, I'm not completely new, but uh, relatively speaking, we're novices <laughs> at, at marriage. Um, and also yesterday we had a whole day marriage seminar. God clearly had something to say. Um, so what more can this half an hour, can I, can I add <laughs> to this? And, and thirdly, um, you know, even as I was preparing and studying the scriptures for this message, just verse after verse, God was convicting me of all the ways that I've sinned and, and need to repent and, and submit myself to his word. So while I will try to... Uh, present what the Bible has to say about marriage in this passage, I would appreciate you praying with me for God's help. So let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us and you have given us the rule by which we are to know you, to live for you, to glorify you. Father, we, uh, we pray for tonight. We pray that you may be the one speaking. I pray that uh, your word would speak into many hearts tonight to bring about conviction and faith. Father, there's so many things to be said about marriage that it's impossible to cover them all in, in this time. But I pray that you may bring a word in season to, to many lives and many marriages that many would be encouraged and strengthened. So we thank you, God, and we um, commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, marriage is a important part, a very important part of most people's lives. Uh, for many, it's getting married is the biggest, most extravagant, most exciting, most tiring and expensive day of your lives. <laughs> um, for many of you, especially the young men, the journey to marriage is filled with many opportunities to display your love for the world to see. <laughs> um, you know, the way you propose, it's got to be extravagant, it's got to be thoughtful, romantic, original, and most importantly, posted on social media. <laughs> uh, the ring you buy has to be unique and elegant and visible. And, uh, and the wedding itself, you know, the venue, the dress, the music, everything is coming together to display to the whole world the love and joy and excitement that the two of you will begin to share in your new life together. Tonight, as we work through the scriptures, we're going to see that marriage itself is, a, is meant to be a display. It's meant to be a display of something even greater, far greater than the love a man has for a woman. So please open your Bibles to Ephesians 5, 
22, and follow along with me. If you're using the Pew Bibles, it's uh, on page 1039. Now, I must put today's passage in context of the chapter that we're in. Last week, we heard our brother Richard unpack Paul's instructions to the church to walk in wisdom and be filled with the Spirit. Today's passage really is a continuation of that point. In fact, verse 22 is the second half of the sentence that starts in verse 21. But I'll backtrack a little bit. Starting from verse 17, Paul says, Don't be foolish like the world, but walk in wisdom and be filled with the Spirit. And then he gives a list of examples of what that looks like. We are to praise one another, uh, praise God <laughs> to one another and in our own hearts. We are to give thanks to God and we are to submit to one another. Then he begins to talk about specific examples of what submitting to one another looks like. And he speaks to three groups. He speaks to wives submitting to husbands, children submitting to parents, and slaves submitting to masters. And our text tonight covers... The first of these three groups, wives submitting to their husbands. And in fact, Paul goes off and talks more about all of marriage. Paul begins to talk about what spirit-filled submission looks like in the context of marriage. So right as we start, we need to remember that none of this is possible without the help of the Holy Spirit. This is not talking about how you, by your effort, can build a perfect marriage. This is about asking the Spirit of God for help. And walking in his wisdom and being filled with his spirit. But then Paul does something quite amazing. He goes on to reveal the ultimate purpose and design of marriage. And all his instructions are based on that purpose. I'm going to show you what that purpose is from the text in a while. But I'll say it now so you know where we're going. Paul tells us that the ultimate purpose of marriage is to display the gospel by pointing to the perfect union of Christ and his bride, the church. And if this is the purpose of marriage, then the main point I want everyone to take away from this passage tonight is this. The spirit-filled marriage puts the gospel on display. The passage that we're looking at divides into three sections. In verse 22 to 24, Paul tells us how wives are called to display the gospel. In verse 25 to 30, he goes on to tell us how husbands are called to display the gospel. And at the end, he explains the basis of his reasoning by revealing God's design purpose for marriage. In verse 31 to 32, God designed marriage to display the gospel. And what I'd like to do is I want to move once very quickly through the whole passage and start by focusing on the last point. Uh, because we have to consider all the practical instructions in light of, the, of this fundamental truth. And then we'll circle back again to the start and look more closely at the instructions for wives and husbands. So, firstly, God designed marriage to display the gospel. Paul tells us that the meaning of human marriage is based on the ultimate reality of Christ's marriage to his church. Here's how he does it. He starts off by telling wives that they must submit to their husbands. And immediately some of you will start to feel uncomfortable because it's not something we want to hear in 2019. We'll look at it more closely a bit later, but for now, just take note of the reason that Paul gives for this command. He says, because the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. Well, what does that mean? So Paul's drawing a parallel between the relationship of a husband and a wife to the relationship between Christ and the church. And as we keep reading, he, he keeps doing this. In verse 21, he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water, etc., etc. He's doing it again. In fact, instead of explaining what husbands need to do to love their wives, he spends far more time on what Christ has done to love the church. He goes on to say that husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies because... No one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. And at this point, Paul quotes Genesis 2.24. The quote is, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then he says, This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. <laughs> 
What on earth is Paul saying? Okay, so firstly, let's try to remember what happened in Genesis 2. God created everything and saw that everything was good. But then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper fit for him. So God put Adam in a deep sleep and he, he took a rib from his side and from that rib he created a woman, the first woman. And when Adam woke up and saw her, he rejoiced and he says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. And the Bible then adds this line of commentary about what just happened saying, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. So what just happened was that at the beginning of creation, God instituted marriage. He created man and woman both in God's image so that men and women are equal in their dignity and value as image bearers of God, yet they are created different. The woman being created as a helper corresponding to the man and God then unites them together in marriage and the two become one flesh. Genesis 2.24 is thus a, a defining statement of what marriage is between a man and a woman. Paul quotes it. And then he adds a further explanation to it, saying, this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, we've already mentioned this a few times in the Ephesians series, but it's worth saying again, when Paul says mystery, we are not to think mysterious, right? We're not to think impossible to comprehend. Uh, rather, mystery always refers to some part of God's sovereign purpose that has been kept hidden, but is now revealed, Earlier in Ephesians 1, we heard Paul reveal the mystery of God's redemptive plan to unite all things in Christ. Then in chapter 2 and 3, again, we heard about the mystery revealed that Gentiles, meaning all of us who aren't Jews, also have a heavenly inheritance in Christ and are members of his body. Now Paul's talking about another mystery. This mystery is marriage. Marriage is a mystery because when God instituted marriage in Genesis 2 as a joining together of a man and a woman, there was a hidden reality that it was pointing to. God has designed marriage to paint a picture of Christ united with his people, the church, and the church becoming the body of Christ. Now, frankly, this is an amazing revelation. You see, Throughout the Bible, there's many pictures used to describe God's relationship with his people. He's the shepherd and we're the sheep. He's the vine and we're the branches. And one of the very common themes that run through the whole Bible is this picture of God as husband and his people as his bride. But Paul's not saying, here's human marriage that existed on its own, and when God was inspiring the Bible. He was looking for a way to communicate the glory of what it means for us to be united to his son. And he says, aha, marriage, that's a good illustration. I'm going to use that as a metaphor to describe the gospel. That's not what Paul is saying. Instead, Paul is saying that in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, God first had a plan to display the glory of his grace by giving his son to die on the cross for sinners to redeem us from our sin, to wash us clean and present us to himself as a holy and radiant people to be united with him forever. That's the gospel, the good news. And then he created marriage, this most intimate, endearing, and transforming relationship that human beings can have. And he designed it in such a way that it would be a, a mini model, a blueprint, reflecting the intimacy that the church will enjoy with her husband, Christ, for all eternity. In other words, this is the statement I made at the beginning. The ultimate purpose of marriage is to display the gospel by pointing to the perfect union between Christ and his bride, the church. Now, this ought to have massive implications for how we understand marriage, and it's completely different how, to how the world understands it. Right, firstly, marriage is a divine institution. It was created by God. It's not just a byproduct of social development. It's not a result of government policy. It's got a higher purpose of glorifying God and pointing to God and displaying the gospel. It also means that marriage is not permanent, nor is it ultimate. It has a purpose 
that will one day no longer be required. Now, don't get me wrong. Marriage should be as permanent as it gets in this life. All right, when you're married to someone, you are one body now. But marriage is not eternal. It ends when one person dies. And Jesus explains in Matthew 22 that in the resurrection, there will be no more marriage. See, one day God's people will all be experiencing the fulfillment of that perfect and eternal intimacy with Christ. And there would no longer be a need for marriage as we know it today to point the way. Some of you might never get married. Or maybe you just feel that way now. You don't have to feel like your life is somehow less worthy because of that. Marriage is one way, but not the only way, that God points to the reality of the gospel. And lastly, there's so much more that could be said, but I'll just point out one more implication. Marriage is by design heterosexual and complementary. There is a reason why God gave husbands and wives different roles in marriage. It's... So that, so that although they are equal in value as human beings, they ha- they're not equal in terms of function and responsibility in the marriage because they're modeling Christ and the church. Trying to break down the roles between husbands and wives or trying to change the definition of marriage to include things like so-called same-sex marriage, it completely misses the point. It misses the point and the purpose for which marriage was designed by God in the first place. Now, with all this in mind, having established that God designed marriage to display the gospel, this is the foundation upon which Paul says to us, Wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands, love your wives. So let's go back to verse 22 again and look at it more carefully. The first thing we'll see is that wives are called to display the gospel. Verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, immediately there's a problem, right? Because submit sounds like such a negative, oppressive word. We live in a country that values democracy, equality, personal rights and freedoms. What place does a word like submission have in our day and age? This is the the first thing that many people do is try to explain away this inequality by looking back to verse 21, where Paul writes, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. And so the argument goes, see, everyone is supposed to submit to everyone else. So husbands need to submit to wives too. It's therefore both ways and equal. There's a few problems with trying to explain verse 21 this way. Firstly, it doesn't explain the fact that in many places in the Bible, Colossians 3, Titus 2, 1 Peter 3, as examples, wives are explicitly instructed to submit to their husbands, but there is never an instruction for husbands to submit to their wives. So at the very least, we have to recognize the Bible is saying there's some unique way that wives are to submit to their husbands, which doesn't apply in reverse. Secondly, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, verse 21 is an introduction to the following three pairs of submission instructions. Wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters. If you try to flatten it out and say verse 21 is its own thing that says every Christian must submit to every other Christian, you're going to have to say parents have to submit to their children and masters have to submit to their slaves or in an equal and mutual way. Now, I believe verse 21 is simply an introductory remark to the topic of spirit-filled submission. And the following sections tell us what that looks like in practice. Who needs to submit to whom? Now, third, and I would like to say this is probably the most undeniable reason to take this command for wives to submit to their husbands at face value. And that's the reason Paul gives. Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Because Paul's basing this command on the fact that human marriage is designed to reflect Christ and the church, the command can never be flipped around. You will never hear Paul say, Husbands, submit to your wife as Christ submits to the church. Because that's not true. Christ is not submitted to the church. Yes, Christ humbled himself. He sacrificed himself. He came not to be served, but to serve. But there was never a moment of doubt that he is the head, that he is in authority. 
over the church. So having established, we have to, we have to accept verse 22 at its plain meaning. We have to also look at what submission means in the context of marriage, what that looks like. Now, this passage tells us how the ideal, spirit-filled marriage ought to function. The wife joyfully submitting to her husband who loves her and cherishes her and willingly lays down his life for her good. Now, if that were always the case, submission would be easy. I don't think anyone would have any complaints about it. Unfortunately, that's usually not the case. We're all sinners. We're self-centered. We're prone to hurt those closest to us. Some of you may have seen very unbiblical applications of submission in practice, or may have heard of people who try to apply so-called submission in a way that's just degrading and unjust. So it may be helpful for me to first point out some things that Paul is not saying when it comes to submission. So firstly, Paul is not saying that submission is to all men in general. The command is for a wife to submit to her own husband, not for all women to submit to all men. Paul's not saying women in general ought to be subordinate to all men, or that men in every arena is in authority over all women. He's speaking to the context of one man and one woman who've pledged themselves to each other in a covenant of marriage. I've got a daughter, and the last thing I want to say to her as she grows up is, you've got to submit to all men. I can't begin to think of how many ways that could go wrong. She's currently three, and uh, so I've got a while to go. But sometimes I start to feel sentimental already, thinking that one day she'll be all grown up and I've got to marry her off. And I'm going to try my best to raise her to be a strong and godly and wise and, and, and God-fearing woman so that she can make the right choices and that she would marry a godly man. And when that day comes, I will tell her, this is the man you are to submit to. Secondly, submission does not equate to obedience without questioning or living in fear. A wife submitting to her husband does not mean she must obey everything he says and does, especially if they are sinful. There is a limit to the parallel between submitting to your husband as to Christ, because your husband is not Christ. He... he, He's not perfect. He makes mistakes. He's a sinner, and he makes bad choices. Most of us, when we read this verse, we immediately think of some extreme cases. Submit to your husbands? What if your husband is hitting you? What if he's telling you to do something sinful? Wives, I need to be clear. If your husband is hitting you, if you're being abused, call the police. This verse is not a license for your husband to do and demand whatever he wants. Men, you have no excuse to use this verse to justify your sin. Maybe you're not physically abusive, but you may be walking in sin and asking your wife to walk with you in your sin. Thinking about my daughter helped solidify this in my mind. If you're holding this verse as a stick over the head of your wife to dominate her, then consider this. Would you be willing for another man to apply it the same way to your daughter? And if the answer is no, then you need to repent. Wives, if your husband is telling you to sin, he is not being the head that he ought to be. He is not loving you as Christ loved the church. I urge you, come and speak to one of the elders or elders' wives. You and your husband needs counseling. See, wives are told to submit to their husbands as to the Lord, which means that before they submit to their husbands, they first submit to God. A wife must not follow her husband into sin. But even if she stands against the sinful will of her husband, she can still do so submissively. She can do this because submission is more of an attitude of the heart than any particular action. And therefore, every, in every marriage, submission might look different. Right? Submission is largely about respecting your husband as the head. Now, I say this because at the very end of our passage in verse 33, Paul summarizes everything he said so far by using a different word, respect. He says, to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself. The wife is to respect her husband. Which tells us that in Paul's mind, he's drawing a very strong connection between submission and respect. Ladies, if you don't already know this, let me tell you, and I I think I can speak for most men There is no one 
whose opinion of us matters more to us than that of our wives. The fact that I know my wife respects me, trusts me, is willing to follow me, that's a tremendous strength and encouragement. So don't underestimate the power you have to strengthen your husband simply by respecting him and submitting to him. Furthermore, submission does not mean agreeing on everything. Wives, you can and should have your own opinions. You shouldn't just be switching off your brains and saying, yes, dear, to everything. God intends for wives to be a helper that compliments her husband. Not compliment, as in always telling him things he wants to hear, right? But compliment means helping him by contributing to where he is lacking, using your strengths and talents to make up for his weaknesses. As a husband, I'm keenly aware that there's so many areas of my life my wife's better than me yet. And though she's willing to submit to me in everything, I'd be foolish not to listen to her and take her advice. My wife and I have an agreement in our family, which is that if after discussing a decision with each other and we can't come to an agreement, we'd apply this verse in, the, in that I would be the one to make the call as the head. But, you know, so far, I, I don't think I've ever had to play that card in our marriage. We've always been able to eventually come to an agreement. And often I'm the one acknowledging her ideas better and that I'm wrong. I would say that if some of you in your marriage is you're frequently having to settle disputes by the husband having to put his foot down and overruling your wife, there's something unhealthy. Again, I would invite you to come and speak to one of the elders in the church for counseling. I'll say one more thing about what submission is not before moving on. Submission is not based on personality, ability, or the value and dignity of the wife as a person. Just because a wife is submissive doesn't mean she needs to be less talkative or more of an introvert. It doesn't mean that she's less capable of decision-making or leadership abilities. See, Jesus, though he is God and equal in divine nature with the Father, submits himself to his Father, not because he's inferior, but because of his role in the Trinity. In the same way, because marriage is meant to be a display of the gospel. Submission is based on the roles that God put in place. The husband is the head, not because all husbands are naturally better leaders, but because the husband and wife are called to display the glorious gospel of God's grace by reflecting the relationship between Christ and the church. Christ being the loving, self-sacrificing head of the church and the church being his body, honoring and submitting to him in every way. So I would like to define submission for wives in this way. Submission is recognizing and respecting the responsibility of the husband to lead and being willing to yield to his responsibility. Isn't this how we all must submit to Christ? Recognizing his lordship over us, respecting his authority and being willing to yield our will to his will? Wives, God holds you responsible for submitting to your husband, which means recognizing that his role is the head of the family and wholeheartedly respecting and helping him to fulfill his mandate to be the head, joyfully yielding to his leadership. In this way, you're putting the gospel on display. You're putting the glory of God above your own glory. You're saying you're denying your self-interest by saying my marriage is not just about how I can come out on top but how I can serve and be a helper. If you insist on holding to your own self-centeredness, you will have a miserable marriage. But when you recognize the truth that marriage is primarily to glorify God and put his gospel on display, submission becomes a blessing and not a burden. And now for the husbands. You too are called to display the gospel. I'm going to be more concise To the husbands, mainly because it's less controversial today to say husbands love your wives than it is to say wives submit to your husbands. However, that is not to say that it isn't just as easy or perhaps even easier for men to get this wrong. Before I say anything, I just want to say again, everything in here that I've studied is a word that speaks to my own life and my own heart, revealing my need to repent. Repent. 
Husbands, this verse's command for you is not make sure your wife is in submission. Your wife is a child of God and God speaks to her directly. Your command is to love her as Christ loved the church. And your role is to be the head. This means you're held responsible for the well-being of your wife. You're responsible to ensure she flourishes. You're responsible for taking initiative to help your whole family grow in maturity and obedience to God. When your wife walks away from the Lord, even though it's not your fault, it's your responsibility to lovingly and relentlessly pursue her, to win her back. And as head, it's your responsibility to shepherd and protect your wife and to put her needs ahead of your own. Husbands, you are called to display the gospel by practicing Christ-like leadership and love. You are to lead and love your wives as Christ loved the church, so that even if you do it imperfectly, your life points to the perfect husband, Christ, who is the unfailing head and protector and provider and lover to his bride, the church. To lead and love in a Christ-like manner means, firstly, that your love must be self-sacrificial. Paul says, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for her. The love that you have for your wife must not only be sentimental or emotional, it's got to be functional. right? Husbands, how have you explicitly sacrificed yourself, your interests, your priorities, and your preferences as an expression of love for your wife? When it comes to choosing between your hobbies and, and, her, and what she enjoys, do you always get your way? When is the last time you sacrificed and told your wife, let me clean the house, look after the kids and cook dinner so you can do something relaxing for a change. It could be small like that, or it could be something major. As it, Maybe it's something like, my current job is putting too much stress on my wife, and I'm going to stop pursuing that career path, take a, a less prominent job, because that's how I can better love my wife. Self-sacrifice is going to look different in every marriage, but if you never feel the cost, if you're never inconvenienced by it, you're doing it wrong. To love her like Christ also means that it is for her good. Christ gave himself for the church to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word to present her to himself in splendor, holy and blameless. In other words, it's not just about self-sacrifice, but self-sacrifice for her good. Christ didn't die just to show off with no benefit to us. He died that we may be forgiven, that we may be sanctified and made holy and united with him forever. That's the greatest good in the universe. So self-sacrifice for her good may mean setting aside more time to pray with your wife, to read and study the Bible with your wife. It may mean going out of your way to create opportunities for her to participate in grace groups and women's ministries and to use her gifts and her talents to serve God and serve the church. Even it means you have to make round trips driving or change your schedule around and so on. And lastly, loving your wife like Christ means that you're seeking your self-interest. And I, I intentionally said it in a confusing way because, well... Aren't we meant to be self-denying? Isn't self-interest a bad thing? But here's what I mean. This is what the text says. Husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This means, husbands, you need to grow in adopting a new biblical perspective. When you got married, you and your wife were joined in one body, like Christ's union with the church. That union is so profound that when Christ loves the church, he's loving his own body. And Paul's saying Christ is loving himself. So you too need to see loving your wife as loving yourself because you are one. It's not about your interest versus her interest. You don't have to give up your benefit for her to benefit. It's not a zero-sum game. No one has to lose for the other one to win. Your benefit, you benefit when she benefits. You gain when she gains. Her well-being is your well-being. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love her as yourself. And in doing so, paint a picture of that glorious, relentless, infallible, and eternal love with which Christ loves his church.
There's so much to say, uh, but I'm going to conclude now. But before I finish, I just want to say a, a few quick words to those of you who are still single and may one day be thinking about marriage. You've sat through a whole message on marriage and thought, what can I do? <laughs> um, I hope you've got something out of this that will help you think biblically, biblically about marriage for you and your future spouse. My question for you is this. What are you looking for in a potential husband or wife? If you're currently interested in someone, what is it about them that you're attracted to? If your answer is, she's hot, or he makes me laugh, think harder. (laughs) Sisters, if your answer is, I don't really think highly of him, but he's the only one who expressed interest in me, so I'm just going to go along with that. I want to encourage you to pray and think very carefully and seek lots of wise counsel. Chances are you're going to have a very hard time practicing submission and respect towards him. Brothers, if you're into her because she's needy and weak and would do anything to please you, you're not thinking about how to love her and lead her, but rather how to use her and abuse her. So all of you, instead, think about how you will one day practice Ephesians 5 in your life. Sisters, think about, can you see yourself joyfully submitting to that man? And brothers, are you prepared to lead and love and lay down your life for her good? I want to end with a story that personally was formative for my understanding of marriage, and especially in Ephesians 5. When I was a a young man um, in my early 20s, I had a close friend, a brother, who was considering proposing, considering marriage. Now, a bit of background, we were both... Asians who grew up in Australia, but our parents are traditional and Chinese. Um, So we we both had imparted to us from young quite secular and traditionally Chinese values of marriage. So he was in a relationship with a, a gentle and godly girl, and he wanted to propose to her, but he was he was deeply conflicted. He knew his parents would not approve, and he's been raised to not approve. And the, reason, the main reason is this. She suffered from some health issues. It wasn't anything major, but it, it potentially meant that there would be limits on the climate of the city that they could one day settle in long term. It could, mean, it could possibly mean limitations on her ability to bear children and take care of kids. It could mean that he's limited in his career prospects and uh, he has to take time to care for, for this woman he wants to be, that he wants to be his wife. So these are all huge red flags to, to Chinese parents, right? So we've been raised to, with the doctrine that marriage is for the honor and the legacy of the family, right? So you, you look for a girl who has good education, good career, good genes, so that your kids will be you know, tall, handsome, and smart, and, and all that. So he was, I remember for months, he would call me, at, like we'd talk on the phone every night, We were both young, we were immature, and we didn't understand the Bible very well, but we were trying to figure it out. We were discussing it and looking through scriptures. I remember he called me one night, and uh, this is after months of indecision, and he sounded certain. And, And he told me, I figured it out. He says, marriage should be about the gospel. You know, I shouldn't be thinking about what I can get out of this marriage, because Christ didn't get anything out of his union with the church. He gave himself to the church for his good, for her good. He says, I need, I need to change, I need to stop thinking about what I can benefit or how I can gain or what I'm going to lose if I were to go into this marriage. I need to think about how I can lead and love and give myself for her. They've been married for about 11 years now. They've got two kids and, uh, you know, I'm just so glad that Every time I I catch up with them, they're not in Australia at the moment, but it's such an encouragement to me. And I always remember that conversation because when he said those words, it clicked for me too. That was the moment I changed my view of marriage. And I realized marriage is not about what I can gain. Marriage is meant to glorify God. The spirit-filled marriage is one that puts the gospel on display. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank, we thank you. We're so thankful that you have saved us.
you have called us out of darkness and into your light. That while we were dead in our sins, you made us alive in Christ. We're thankful that you gave us your Son, not just to lord over us, but to love us, that we may be united with him forever. Father, we're thankful to you that you have given us marriage, this great joy in our life where we can learn so much about what your love means and we can be sanctified and and growing in maturity and sharpening one another as iron sharpens iron. And we pray, God, that you would, you would help every single one of us to, to live every day of our lives with your glory, with your gospel in mind, that we would do nothing out of self-interest, out of selfish ambition, out of spite for one another. But God, help us to, to conform to your word. Help every wife or wife to be, to be that glorious, submissive, encouraging, helping, and respecting reflection of the church. And help every husband or husband to be, to, to point to the great husband and lover and savior and leader and protector of us all, Christ. We thank you, God, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen.